something is better than nothing. So if we're talking about in the gym, doing two sets of an exercise, that's enough to get a little bit stronger, grow a little bit of muscle. Two sets is better than one set, is better than no sets. Walking, moving around for 10 minutes a day is better than five minutes a day, is better than not at all. You don't have to set standards or goals that are super high. Welcome to Sweet Liberation. We are so excited about today's episode because we are joined by professors in sports and exercise science from Lehman College in New York, Alec Pinheiro and Adam Mohan. Welcome, welcome to the show today. We are so excited to have you here. Cool. Thanks Thank for you. having us. It's great to Thank be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been such a um, a journey for us of discovery and also of meeting people from across the world, really in this this entire rabbit hole of well-being that we entered in Sweet Liberation, starting with us taking sugar out of our lives and really being passionate about that and then branching out into so much in the world. And this is something that I'm sure you also are sharing with us in, in the passion really to educate people across the world in what's going on with well-being, exercise, nutrition. So tell us a little bit about your journeys into becoming professors in exercise science, for goodness sake. For me, I'm being so sedentary today, I couldn't be more ashamed of myself. So take it away. Tell us tell us a bit more, Alec, uh, about your journey, and then we'll move over to you, Adam. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I think probably my, I mean, as with a lot of people, I played sports, I was fairly active young, um, but my passion for health, um, helping people kind of make those improvements to their lives, um, be that through exercise, nutrition, um, all of the above. Um, I started working at a few different gyms, actually in China. Um, I lived in Beijing for seven years. Um, and I decided it was, it was relatively informal, the, the way that I started working with people. Um, but when I moved back to the US, um, I started pursuing it kind of more, more as a career um, and uh, just absorbing all that I could and trying to um, build on that and to give back and help and now to help teach as well. Um, and, and focus on just making people more aware of what's going on with them, um, their surroundings and in their bodies, what their bodies can do. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Amazing. Amazing. What about you, Adam? Uh, it's a it's like sort of a similar story. Um, I was actually a Lehman undergrad student and I found a love of exercise science through studying philosophy undergrad here. Uh, so not the same typical path. I've always been athletic, done sports, done some martial arts, um, but it wasn't until about uh, maybe 11, 12 years ago that I, I met some people here that inspired me. And I, I, I'm the type of person that I sort of have to get deep into things and get focused and obsessed. Um, and I just found a love of like training and coaching. And, and I was like, oh, I wanted, I wanted a bit more. I wanted to understand a bit more. I didn't, I felt like I didn't know enough. Um, so I just started to get really practical. I, I became a coach and I did that for a very long time. And then I found out there was going to be um, higher learning here eventually. So I waited for that and then um, dabbled into that. And I just, you know, just want people to understand why it's so important to, to be fit and active and, and healthy and to live just more fruitful lives generally. Amazing. To really have ink, Pat. <laughs> That's brilliant. Luke is nodding away over there. This yeah. guy, he's also he's also got a, a bit of a sporty background, so I'm sure he's itching to ask you some questions. Well, in interestingly, we one of the you, things, Luke. the, um, you should be able to hear me okay. Can you not hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, All right. I can. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I, I've got a bit of a cycling background and in the UK, uh, we're pretty very much into the sort of sports science and things and uh, the, the marginal gains around different sports. You know, uh, is that something, I mean, do you look at, or presumably you look at a lot of the different elements to bring those things together? Yeah, Adam, maybe you can, can speak on that, especially uh, you've had more work with populations who are kind of that would apply to, right? Yeah, I, I think it, 
uh, Alec is being a bit humble. He's been a, a CrossFit coach and trainer for a very long time, uh, especially in, in, in China as well. So that's something that I, I think it'd be great for him to elaborate on. But I, in my own experience, I, um, overall, like when I started to, to coach, um, uh, I, I like to tell people that this is a very applied science, despite it being highly theoretical. Um, and, you know, both Alec and I, we teach, um, a lot, a lot of aspects of this, and try to have that sort of like nuance balanced when we're we're you know, educating our students. But um, it is very interesting. It is a very interesting science when you have clients and that you're coaching for a specific sports or athletic background. Um, like I've coached uh, powerlifters, um, I've coached uh, quite a bit of fighters, and uh, some athletes. When it comes to just like basketball players, a few swimmers, um, and then trying to sort of incorporate what you've learned uh via experience as well as like what you've learned via education or academia is a bit interesting when you're trying to prep an athlete for a competition or an event um because they have specific goals when it comes to performance and things so it is a bit fascinating and it and, uh, it becomes a bit more visceral and real rather than educating students to do so and do the same thing uh that we're doing out there in the field um but I'm, I'm sure Alec can also expand on like how well, it is uh, with CrossFit and CrossFit is just very fascinating overall. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I could definitely talk about, I, I just have to say, Luke, um, anytime someone says that they're a cycler or a runner or a swimmer, I, I mean, my hat's off to you. Just being able to, I mean, I, I assume that means you're sitting on the bike for 10, 20, 40, 50 K kilometers at a time. Um, like that's, amazing to me i can't imagine doing that yeah well it's a funny thing about cycling is that i always say it's one of the hardest sports because you know it's not like marathon running because if you get tired in a marathon you fall over right you're actually sitting down and relatively comfortable so the suffering in cycling goes on and on and on then you multiply that by three weeks if you're doing the tour de france so yeah so for me you know me and my buddies we might cycle that we've got a big um goal Gorge called the Cheddar Gorge, where the cheese comes from, and we might cycle out there. Now that's a hundred miles. Uh, as a you know, it takes us sort of five hours at twenty miles an hour. So that's so you got to feed right on those sorts of cycle trips, you know, because you know you set off in the morning with your buddies, and you know it's quite a strenuous ride out, you know, to do that. And so you get into a lot of the you know uh, you know everything, every element of the sporting thing that you're doing, the fueling, you know, the aerodynamics, you know, the, all the mechanical side of things and in the sky team when they were doing a lot of they they put together a pretty competitive team back in the day and they were looking at the it was the aggregation of marginal gains that they called it it was all the tiny little elements that when they were all added together made a big dramatic change it might only have been eight percent change but that's a big difference isn't it over as you guys know over the competition Yeah, I, that makes sense. I, you know, it's it's a funny thing. We can often get very stuck in research into looking at those tiny things, looking at what's at the margins, um, trying to isolate variables. And I mean, that's that's the goal. It's regardless of whether it's exercise it's happening in you know in a weight room or in a petri dish. If you're conducting an experiment and conducting a study, you're trying to drive at okay, what's actually making a difference, um, and. And so it's very tempting to stay kind of focused in that micro. Um, but like you said, once you zoom out and once you're able to actually apply it, um, I think what's a fun part of our jobs, uh, whether we're talking with students, general public, um, or, or just each other, but figuring how these things can all be put together. And okay, yeah, we know all these little bits of information, but what does that mean when you apply it? Um, you know, if we're looking at movement efficiency for cycling, breathing efficiency, um, if you're looking at preparation, if you're looking at nutrition, hydration, like you said, all of these things, you know, they move the, the needle a tick, but mm -hmm. you put a bunch of ticks together uh, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you've got that one, two, three, eight, ten percent. And that's it's very cool. Oh yeah. my goodness. I feel like I think I, I feel like I've walked into the locker room of the boys of the boys like changing room. I understand nothing about what's going on here. So I'm going to ask from the completely ignoramus point of view now. I like watching some sport. Um, we, I, I, I love staying active. 
uh, mainly through, I used to do some weight training in the old days. Uh, I need to start doing a bit more because at my age, we need to, you know, keep our muscle muscles strong. I love dancing, but that's it. I'm not, I've never done any competitive sports. So do you mind if I ask you some questions from a very, very basic point of view? Um, CrossFit. Now, I know that people talk about CrossFit and they talk about it. Um, I, I, somebody said to me, you need to start because it becomes like a religion. I was like, really? People get really mad and get really, really passionate about CrossFit. Tell us about, for most people that don't know about CrossFit, please tell us about it. And what made you, what, what was it about that that got you into becoming a professor at, at the college? I mean, it's a big jump from loving a sport to, to getting right into the science of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I guess before before I say that, what what have you heard about CrossFit besides that it's people love it? It's really hard. But, okay. <laughs> and I don't know very much more. That is all I know. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, when I was in, so I started when I was in Beijing and I was in China. Um, and at the time, there were maybe two gyms in the whole country of. 1.4 billion people. Um, there are a lot. It was a lot more popular in Europe and in North America, um, but it it was starting to grow. It was starting to pick up, and it was an interesting time where you had the there were the people who were competitive um, and wanted to compete. Um, CrossFit essentially it's a mix of all different kinds of movements, modalities. Um, it's a hodgepodge of things from swimming to running to weightlifting to gymnastics. Um, trying to get at, uh, like when you say like, oh, is that person fit? Um, you know, that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. CrossFit, um, was sort of trying to define that, um, you know, their tagline is finding the, the fittest on earth. Um, so in all ways of that testing, all different kinds of time domains. So you might have people run, um, a half marathon, um, and the same people and then, and then go do a max effort lift. Um, so not the type of things that is generally being combined in most sports. You know, a lot of um, a lot of training for CrossFit will look similar to what professional athletes do for strength and conditioning. Um, but for CrossFit, that's that's the sport is the strength and conditioning part. It's just the training. Um, and so it's a, it's an interesting sort of almost gamification of that. Um, what I think is one of its benefits in addition to just kind of being interesting you know each class is something different um every time you go in you're doing a maybe learning a new movement or testing yourself in a different way seeing how much you've improved um seeing what you haven't improved that when you want to work on more um one of the things that and this isn't just crossfit um but i think crossfit um, largely popularized it is this idea of community um, and how important that is to keeping people coming back i mean that's what the, it's what most people are looking for. Um, it's what most people need. It helps form those habits and those connections. Um, it keeps you accountable. So whether that's, I mean, things like a book club, a lot of people aren't going to read on their own, but if they know and okay, in two weeks, I need to meet up with a group of people and talk about it, they're going to read the book. Same idea here. You know, if they, they know, oh, these people are going to be in class and they're going to ask me where I was if I wasn't there. All right, I'll go. Um, so I think that it's not just CrossFit that does that, but CrossFit does it particularly well. Um, and I, I really like that aspect of being able to introduce fitness and exercise and health um, to people from all different backgrounds, to dancers, to cyclists, to people who had never done anything before, yogis. Um, and people could come in and bring their strengths, you know, someone who, let's say you're a dancer, um, so maybe your coordination and your flexibility is better than most other people's. You come in and you can do a lot of the movements that people who have been at CrossFit for years, maybe not be able to do. That's that's pretty cool. Everyone comes in with their own strengths um, and to, to add that to the mix. Amazing. Wow. Amazing. Well, that's, it. yes, I think, I think that's probably something I need to explore as I'm getting older, because I think it's that agility. And also, I don't, does it also combine like sprinting and like fast uh, actions like that? Because yeah, I, I for sure. I feel like that's what my body's more made for. So um, is it combining things like almost from the hunter-gatherer times, it seems, uh, in that kind of combination of, of sedentary and then expulsive movement? Is that something that's part of CrossFit as well? Yeah, there are lots of movements. <laughs> to be fair, I, I think some of it is, is marketing for sure. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of it is, I, I think you could say that about most physical activities. Um, I think that the, the term functional fitness 
functional movements have maybe become a little overused, um, especially in recent years. Um, you know, what is pretty, if you can move better, if you can move longer, if you can lift heavier things, that's, that's probably pretty functional. Um, but this idea of picking something up and carrying it somewhere else or moving it across a certain distance faster, um, getting at those principles is developing that capacity to, yeah, to, to live out your life just in, more capably. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'm, I'm going to come and ask you about what your discoveries have been over the last few years in your in your current role. But um, but Adam, in in terms of the, you said that you've been involved in martial arts. So tell us how that's kind of uh, taken you now into this field of of working in a college and research. What is what is really grabbing you right now in in your research and uh, uh, in 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 those areas? That that's a that's an actually great question. Um, just because I think growing up doing martial arts is something very different. Um, I grew up dabbling quite a bit for since I was uh, I don't know seven years old, and and now I'm in my thirties, and I've been like uh, the knowledge gaps have sort of filled um, drastically very differently, right? So there's this stigma that you have growing up um, when you go to different schools. Um, the sort of lack of, of knowledge of how to train healthily and properly, and you're pushing yourself past um, probably like overtraining and overreaching, uh, negatively contributing to a lot of injuries and a lot of issues. And um, whether we're, well, that's like good or bad for the for the mind or, and the body, I think that now my the important thing that I'm trying to do is ensure that for myself and the people that I coach and the people sort of that I mentor, that they're doing these things healthily uh, so they can do it long term rather than just sort of short, short bursts of time and then they get injured and then, okay, now they're out uh, doing martial arts and they can't do it and they have to get surgery or there's they have to go to a PT. Um, there's a lot of that. Um, a lot of people don't really necessarily talk about within like whether it be boxing or wrestling or, or, or jujitsu or anything of that nature. Um, and again, you see it on uh, in a lot of sports uh, that are televised, uh, whether it be like UFC or, or uh, boxing matches, um, right? Training smartly um, and, and sort of guiding your your training like parameters and, and with uh, the educational academic aspect is just over always typically a, a better thing, right? To make sure that you're training long term. Um, I think it's just a, it's a bit surreal, right? Because I, I started doing it and then I had a very different mindset and then there was a switch. Uh, and then I had some of my peers notice that switch and they were like, wait, what happened? You're completely different how you view things. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm viewing things much better. Um, uh, just more nuanced perspective, right? I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing this like an old age, right? As opposed to just like uh, not around, just like limping with arthritis constantly, right? Or just like, I can't even continue to do it, um, but I, th I think that's just a bit how my perspective has changed. I would argue for the better. I'm not quite sure if everyone else will would argue the same thing, but <laughs> well, well, can I, can I? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, Please I do. wanted to ask. Um, just it, it's a good, nice opportunity for me. Adam and I work very closely together. Um, we see each other all the time. We talk all the time, so it's rare that um, we would get I get a chance to interview him. Um, but. I'm just curious from and from your perspective, um, since doing the research here, um, all the studies that you've been involved with, has has that changed your mind on anything um, that you thought about before? Whereas when you kind of peek behind the curtain, um, or just just being involved in in helping to produce this information and discover these things, um, is there anything different? I think that is a great question. Um, one immediate thought when you just asked that, I think, is that I want to, this is just a, a quick little joke. I, Alec and I talk, all, again, all the time, but that I probably want to box less and do some some other form of thing just because I just don't want, I need my mind for, for the work that I do. So getting any sort of like head trauma or concussions or getting hit in the head or the face is not, is not something that's conducive to any any uh, continuing my career forward. but. Um, I think that's a great question when it comes to just like training smartly when it comes to fatigue. Um, don't want to get like, 
nitty gritty, but like fatigue is something that we always, it's just this weird concept that we try to sort of understand uh, in training and in research. Still not fully understood, not a lot of research that needs to be done, but pushing yourself past certain physiological levels is probably not the best. I used to think that, you know, um, my perception, similar, I, I can imagine for CrossFit, right? You're training pretty intensely. And in order to make sure that you're not getting injured or increasing the potentiality for injury, you have to sort of manage that fatigue and that that stimuli, right? Uh, so it's interesting that two separate physical activities that Alec and I do are both dabbled in the idea of sort of managing that fatigue and trying to train smartly, right? Not pushing yourself past that that point of no return where you're like, oh man, this was a hard training session and I keep doing this, I may, I may get injured or um, I may not be able to recover properly for the next training session. So I think my mindset when it comes to just like, well, today I just don't feel like training is hard. Cause it's, you know what I mean? It's just probably best uh, best for my, like my mental state or, or, or just for my overall body that's pretty beat up, right? And I'm sure, Alec, to, to turn that question back to you, right? I, I've done CrossFit maybe like three times, right? So not as much as as you have, how has your perception drastically changed from pre, pre-research and now current, during, and post-research? Uh, in terms of CrossFit? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know that it's changed as much um, or, or that it's changed that much. I think what is nice um, you know, one of the things that we find out, so our, our lab, the Applied Muscle Development Lab at Lehman, um, most of our research focus is on muscle strength, uh, muscle growth, things like that. Lots of, lots of muscle, um, as you can tell from the name. Um, what we focus on, um, because there are only, well, kind of only so many ways that muscles can grow. Um, so you would think, but somehow, um, you know, every year we end up finding three or four other ways to study it. Um, the upshot of that is that we learned that there are many, many different ways to get the results that you want to get. Um, and so I think that, you know, being, uh, it, it can be tempting to find something that works and stick to that. And then you say, you know, this is, this is the only thing that's going to get me to point B from point A. Um, but there are many different ways to get there. They might not all work for all people. Um, and so I think, you know, if I was going to relate it to CrossFit, CrossFit is great. Um, I think it has many benefits. I think it works for a lot of people. There are lots of things I think that do. Um, and so being able to, to not be dogmatic, um, and to really just figure out where, where you should go, what's going to work for you. I think that that, um, is probably one of the biggest takeaways. Oh my goodness. Uh, May I interject if that, if possible? I had a an interesting aspect that you brought up as well, um, like why it works for people is the community aspect, right? So in where we're from, just in New York, we've noticed an, an uptick in like um, run clubs, right? I'm not, it, I'm not sure if you guys have also noticed that, but run clubs are now a thing yes. uh, and there's just so many of them. And I think that it's it's a great thing just because it's working for a lot of people, right? Physical activity is up in, in the inner city and the boroughs, which is a great thing, right? Because they haven't always been the highest as they should be. So a lot of people, just because of that community aspect, similarly to CrossFit, right? They have that support for their peers, pushing them to run at least twice a week, right? To run marathons, to uh, just go for a jog, to walk the local area. And I think not everything to that point uh, as Alec sort of allude, alluded to, is that different things work for different people, right? And then one takeaway I would say is that, like, you need to sort of find what works for you. Um, and I think we sort of have certain standards for things, obviously, like fitness standards and levels and normative values that we try to push on people. But again, if running twice a week works for you to increase your physical activity, then that's just overall, I think, a great thing, or rather CrossFit or martial arts, to, for that matter. Just wanted to throw that in there. Amazing, amazing. My, my son is say... a boxer. Uh, he was he was boxing. Since... <laughs> Go ahead, Luke. 
No, I was just going to say what's become really popular in the UK is the thing called a park run. Now, this is some sort of crazy thing that people do on a Saturday morning at nine o'clock. And there's like hundreds of people and they descend on a local park and they all do a park run. But I think you're right. That community thing of just showing up and doing the sort of a jog around the park with 500 other people. I mean, there's no real room to run because there's just so many people. You know, it's like the start of a marathon or something that you see, you know, in New York or whatever. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, is, is the preparation for the people that you're coaching quite different than if they're doing martial arts or uh, to the CrossFit? Are you preparing people quite differently because they're quite different activities? Yeah, they're the very, I'm sure Alec can uh, speak on sort of the CrossFit, but I mean, the science, the the idea of like the scientific concepts are, concepts are very, it's pretty much very similar, right? Um, different sports require different physiological demands, different types of nutrition uh, because of that. And also like different types of like, for example, different types of martial arts or different activities in CrossFit require different things, right? So you need to design training programs and systems for your clients uh, around those requirements and those demands, right? So they have to be very specific to those things, um, just like anything else, right? If you want to prove upon uh, a certain outcome, right, uh, you have to design specific goals and, and marker points to fit that overall outcome, right? Just anything else. Yeah. Got it. Not yeah. sure if you wanted to add anything, Alec, from a CrossFit perspective. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the, um, uh, again, CrossFit is because of the nature of the sport. Um, the athletes at the top have to be able to do everything all the time in the competition. The competition, um, maybe, you know, the, the championships may be something like five days and they're doing um, somewhere between, you know, 10 to 13 different events. And so some of those may be cycling a bunch. Some of those may be walking on their hands. Um, some of them may be lifting heavy weights. Some of them may be carrying, you know, um, lifting a bale of hay and throwing it. Um, it, it's, it could be anything. It's a mix of things. Um, and so for something like that, it's you kind of just need to be in really good shape um, and know, have good body awareness, know when you get tired, when you need to rest, things like that. Um, yeah, that, I guess that's all I, uh, to say about, about that. But um, what's nice is we can also take those principles. So something complicated like that, you can still distill it into smaller steps. Um, and I think we can extrapolate that to really any situation. Um, one of the classes that we teach is about testing. Um, so in other words, how do you evaluate a client or a patient, um, everyday population, just a normal person, when you start working with them, what's an important um, piece of information to know? Um, one of the reasons that you test them when you come in is so that you can see if they're making progress. Um, how do you know if they're making progress? Well, you need to know what their goals are. And so you have SMART goals. Um, and these goals are set up where you have something that is specific to them. Um, you want something that is measurable. Um, you want something that's realistic to attain. Um, and you want it to be time bound. Um, so you want it to be something that it's like, okay, I need to set this goal and it needs to be something that I know I can achieve, um, but there's a deadline. Um, and then you work backwards from that, break it down into smaller steps, um, and you can see whether or not you're making progress. Um, whether you're a top athlete um, or whether you're someone who's just trying to, um, quote unquote, you know, get your diet in order. Um, I, I know that that's a, a hot topic uh, <laughs> on your podcast is, is how to achieve that. Um, but it can be overwhelming for many people who don't know where to start and who are starting from a place of, I don't know anything, um, or maybe I used to do something. Sometimes the people who used to do um, the, the, the healthy thing, um, it's even harder for them to start because they're so far away from it. Um, and, and so being able to identify those small steps and make those small changes, um, overcome that inertia and that initial barrier to, mo to, to just making any movement at all, um, that's kind of the key the, the key thing that we can do. Oh my God, you're talking to me. Have you been in my house? In my house? Got a camera in here. <laughs> He's talking about inertia. It's just, look, let's talk about inertia. I'm triggered right now about that because having, I have had good levels of fitness in my life before. And I'm one of these people that gets into shape very quickly, which is quite annoying for a lot of people that 
in my family, for instance. I don't know, they call that, is that fast twitch muscle fibers or something like that. When I start working out the next day, you can start to see a difference, um, which is really annoying. But, which means that I'm quite lazy. You see, this is the problem, double-edged sword. How do we overcome the psychological inertia when we have been sitting in a chair doing stuff on a laptop online and things like that these sedentary jobs how do we overcome that inertia what is the psychological tricks that you experts can impart on us especially me i'm talking about me right now <laughs> uh i take a stab at it first um so i i think the uh taking the approach that and it's it's trite but less is more um one of the things that's going to predict whether someone is able to maintain a habit um, is kind of how how big of a change it requires them to make in their lives. Um, everyone has the New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions, I think, um, in principle, are, are, are probably good. You know, it's good to want to make changes. Um, and it's nice to have that time-bound aspect where you say, okay, um, I need to make this, this change when this time hits. Um, but very often, it's a sweeping lifestyle change, uh, maybe multiple lifestyle changes compounded and added on top of each other, which just because the, the calendar says January 1st doesn't mean your actual day-to-day -day life has changed at all to allow these huge, magnificent, sweeping um, alterations to, to happen and accommodate that. So really finding the smallest step possible that you can take and making it a habit until you stop thinking about it. Everything we do going throughout our days, um, when we wake up, you know, whether we reach for coffee first or brush our teeth first or um, pop something on the stove to eat, that's all the habit. We don't really have to think about that. Um, and so ideally you want to make the, the things that are going to move you towards your goal, move you in the right direction. You want those to be habitual where you don't have to expend any willpower. You don't have to expend any mental energy. You just do it. The easiest way to do that is to, to do something small. So if you if your goal is to, um, let's say, I, I want to consume more fiber, right? We know that fiber is, is good for us. Um, well, are we going to do that by swapping out all of the, um, let's say, processed foods immediately and just say green vegetables, you know, no more processed foods in the house? That can work for some people. Um, I think that those people are probably few and far between and much fewer and more far between than, than probably we would think. Um, the best thing we can do is just add something in. Okay, instead of taking things away, I'm going to add a serving of vegetables. I'm going to add a fruit that I like. Start something small, something with, with that low level of inertia to overcome. Once you get into that habit, um, you can add something else, but you, you can always add more. It's a lot harder to, to take things away. I love that. I love that. Start small. Start small. Start. I'm gonna have that on my shoulder, Alec. You have achieved something. I'm going to let you know what I've done tomorrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, is that is brilliant. And I know that's what Luke's been telling. I know, Luke, you've been telling me for ages, but I do need <laughs> to start moving a little bit more and getting myself more active. <laughs> and he says... I think uh, if I may interject as well, like um, just to sort of add on to what Alex said, I think an interesting thing is like what we also teach our students is sort of creating like a profile Right. So when we when we have like a we tell our students, like, OK, when you have an athlete or a client, you kind of have to create like a realistic profile of the certain markers in their life of fitness and nutrition that they sort of have to have a real conversation and assess. Right. So how is their physical activity level? Well, it's not the best, but it could be better. Right. Like what's their relationship with food? Like how much what type of food are they consuming? Right. What small changes like marginal gains? Uh, that sort of Alec was uh, sort of alluding to and talking about, right? How can we make those small changes, right? Like I know personally, you know, even with yourself, right? Like if there are certain physical changes you want to make, or let's say you want to run for a marathon, or let's say Alec wants to be participate in the next CrossFit, um, he's going to have a real conversation with himself. Okay, how can I get better at this small thing, right? Um, what's my relationship like with food, right? Should I buy candy and leave it in the house? No, because I'm probably going to eat it because I love candy, right? I probably shouldn't do that, right? Or um, instead of just sitting down all day, maybe I should get a standing desk, right? Trying to have that real conversation of encouraging certain things, those little small minutia sort of things that can add up and compound over a period of time to improve upon like someone's overall well-being um, is just sort of something that we you know, we try to communicate with people, right? Whatever it's coaching, 
within research uh, to our students, um, I think that's probably the best thing you can do, right? Having that real conversation with yourself, like, man, I'm not good at this. I, I'm, I don't have the best relationship with food, right? I, I probably shouldn't be going out to eat, you know, every single weekend, right? Um, just little things like that, I think, can, over a period of time, like, can, can expound and, and, and compound after the fact. Yeah. I'm loving that. It's it's removing of that psychological barrier right there. It's this is this is this is the place where all all success or failures happen. It's just right <laughs> there in front of you, and uh, and it's and it's brilliant that that just disappears all barriers by saying those those two pieces of advice have been gold. Been gold. I I will. Um, I just want to add one thing, if that's okay. Yes. Um, yes. On top of, so you, because you mentioned success or, fa or failure, you know, that the barriers that are right there, I think it's also important um, for ourselves, for anyone we're working with, talking with, um, success or failure isn't determined by just one thing in terms of, you know, one failure doesn't mean that we have failed. Um, so if you've made that small change and you one day you don't eat that vegetable, that doesn't mean that, oh, uh, I'm off now and I can't do anything to come back for it. Um, I think that recognizing that there are always going to be ups and downs. Um, people who are recovering from an injury, surgery, chronic pain, things like that, they're going to be good days, there are gonna be bad days. And as long as overall we're trending in the direction we want to go, that's what's going to make the biggest difference over time um, is how consistent you are. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And, um, and I know that you both are really keen and this is the, the, the area of study that you are, are doing is around muscles. Now, Luke and I are biohacking as much as we can. I know that's a really trendy term right now, but what we really mean by that is we're trying to defy time if we can at this age. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you finding out about, <laughs> about the, the importance of muscle in health? Because we know it's a very hot topic uh, online at the moment and the discovery of the importance of muscle and maintaining good muscle for longevity and quality of life. What have you both discovered around that? Let's go to Adam first. Oh. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think, well, I think one thing I want to say is that previously, uh, the sort of accepted stigma, I'll use the term stigma um, just loosely, uh, previously that like aerobic activity is really important for, you know, your respiratory system, uh, overall cardiovascular system, reducing core mobilities, um, all cause mortality rates. Uh, that isn't necessarily balls, we do have a lot of research, but they haven't, we've sort of like put resistance training to the side and like muscle growth over periods of time as we continue to age. And now we're finding um, how much, how important it is to be training to continually grow muscle as we age due to sarcopenia, um, issues with uh, just arthritis over periods of time, issues with uh, balance and falling over in an old age, um, just issues of being able to move and have a healthy lifestyle functionally, uh, being able to get up and go, um, to sit down properly for everyday activities. Um, so I think that there is a shift that's happening um, within research and maybe in, in, in sort of fitness pop culture, I like to say, um, that emphasis on incorporating both aspects of like aerobic training, uh, which is good for many, many uh, sort of overall fitness markers for your heart and everything I previously mentioned, but also resistance training to make, ensure that you're able to get up and go, right? Because strength, um, having a good amount of muscle and strength uh, later on in life, right, is going to contribute to a better over quality of life um, outside of everything else. Um, we're big on, uh, on, on muscle growth here in, in, in our lab and, and pushing it forward. Um, as much as we possibly can. Um, I think that a lot of research will continue to come out sort of in support of that, um, or maybe um, not as, as uh, not as, as, as in support overall when it comes to that, but um, it's just interesting to see that shift over, over sort of a period of time. Mm -hmm. I was gonna also okay. ask about that, if I can just butt in with that to, to ask before I was doing that. Again. And that was just to really say, you know, what, what's the key to muscle growth? You know, you guys are experts. I mean, I've been working out for the last few months quite 
dramatically. I've been trying to get my one gram of protein mm -hmm. for one pound of body fat I into my one gram of protein. And I just wondered, you know, is that doing the right thing? You know, what do you guys recommend if you, for somebody that's a bit older and a bit senior and not wanting to, you know, the atrophy is a big issue when you get to slightly senior and you're losing weight and you think, Hey, this is, this is really good. I'm a lot lighter than I was a year ago, but then you realize what's actually happened is you've everything in your body is shrunk and you know, your arms are shrunk, your legs are shrunk, all of these things. Can you give any quick tips and tricks to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, it sounds like you're, uh, already doing a lot of the right things. I mean, you're very active, you're, you're lifting weights, um, you know, doing things that physically will stimulate muscle growth. Another thing that of course, um, as everyone gets older that we have to be aware of is the are things like osteoporosis. So weight bearing activities are very important. Um, cardio activities that not only, um, so not only like cycling, but also weight bearing. So where you're, where you're walking, maybe hiking, things like that, depending, I guess you don't live in Wales, but I, I feel like Wales would probably lend itself to hiking more. Um, so maybe not below here. Um, but, uh, so the, the physical activity to, to make sure that your bones are as dense and as healthy as they can be, um, the resistance training. And then, as you said, um, protein consumption, um, as we get older, it's harder and harder for our bodies to stimulate muscle growth and use the protein that we consume. Um, the, uh, the importance of protein consumption um, probably goes up as we age. I mean, protein is used for a lot of things in our body. Um, and so being, being sure to, even though um, our appetites tend to diminish um, and uh, I don't know, sweet, like our, uh, our palates tend to adjust more toward and look for sweet things and more palatable options. Um, but really making sure that we're still consuming enough protein. Um, you know, the generally accepted um, for, for most of our life, protein range will be somewhere like 1.6 to 2, 2.3 um, grams per kilogram of body weight. Um, if the, the gram per pound, if that works for you, that's, you know, yeah. that's fine. Um, but the yeah. keeping that consistent um, and really just making sure that you are, you are eating enough to support your goals. Yeah, got it. But it, it sounds like uh, it sounds like you're on the right track. Yeah, uh, trying to do the right things. Trying to do the right things. Actually, the other thing I was going to say just very quick was that on that point, actually, is the one of the things Nabila and I have done is got into quite a lot of serious supplementation. And actually, we've discovered quite a lot of things recently. Um, the you know, and, uh, and what I used to find when I was training is overtraining um and and actually getting injured quite quickly but through some of the supplementation i found that things like injuries have cleared up a lot quicker so things like a lot of the b supplement the b vitamins the d you know mnn uh, as, a, as, a, as part of the, the B the B range, and that has helped massively with regard to stopping the injury side. Um, yeah, I used to do a bit of Taekwondo, Adam. So I'm with you when you know the, the concussion days for me are, are, are gone. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. You know, I used to spend every week being concussed and taking paracetamol. So <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm not I'm not those days are I'm past on that. But um, yeah, no, it's you know. So do, do you guys recommend? And, you know certain supplementation for for people as well is that part of what you you guys are doing you guys are <laughs> so in you know, it's funny in, oh I, I, you can jump it too but um in the state of new york we're not actually allowed to give nutritional <laughs> advice without oh. uh without a certification um so we would never oh. officially recommend it um i will say yeah, well, in general, what we what we might say are good practices. This is unofficial. Um, this is unofficial right now. <laughs> the it, if you're able to to have a balanced diet that is full of the the macronutrients, um, you're getting most of your food from a wide variety of whole foods. You're probably going to hit the targets that you need. Um, as as you get older, um, if you're not consuming as much of those foods. Uh, maybe you have, especially things that are, that will help with, uh, maintaining your bone density. So yeah. calcium, vitamin D, things like that. Um, yeah. stopping smoking, not drinking as much. Um, 
but those can all, so, I mean, those can over time have an effect on bone health, especially, um, which in, in addition to, to muscle strength and muscle mass is a, a predictor of successful and healthy aging. Um, but supplements specifically, um, I, I think it really depends person to person, um, you know, to filling in the gaps that you need, making sure you're, you're getting vitamins and minerals. But most of that, um, I, I would say most of that outside of the standard North American diet um, is people are going to be, for the most part, hitting those marks. Yeah. yeah. What, what are your thoughts, Adam? Yeah, I think that's I'm sort of, um, so Alec and I are probably intellectually going to align so much. Uh, uh, we're in a lot of the similar camp, like intellectual sort of knowledge camps, but I think doing your best, um, the recommendation that we sort of always try to prescribe to people, unofficially prescribe, unofficially prescribe, right? Um, is that doing your best to try to sort of get those nutrients out of whole foods um, rather than supplementing. Granted, um, it all depends on someone's lifestyle and case by case basis, right? It's a bit difficult for people, for certain people to get all of those nutrients largely dependent if like their diets are not up to par, or if they're not eating the, the best quality food, or if they don't have access to those foods, right? Um, if they can't afford those foods, um, uh, but I will say that like if they are, if people are trying to do their best to sort of eat balanced diets, they're probably going to meet most of sort of those markers, right? Largely depending on your physical activity levels, right? If you're in sort of sports, right? If you're about to hit an Ironman competition um, or if you're going to be in a cycling, you know, 34 miles, um, then supplementation tends to sort of help as an additional aspect. That's the sort of whole point of like supplementing your nutrition, right? Um, but again, you want to make sure that you're sort of knocking off of those those barriers, right? Like you want to make sure that you're hitting all of those marks, right? That your nutrition, your standard everyday food, uh, as much as you, you know, your fruits and veggies as much as you can. But also, um, if there's a need, again, it depends on each person and their lifestyle, right? Um, as, as per usual. Um, so similar take there. Uh, uh, just, um, it's always going to, we're always going to sort of, unofficially prescribed the, the the original like whole foods and, and, and that overall diet. And, and if there's a need, then supplements can help uh, as Alec alluded to, you know, you know, I, I will say, I think maybe the, the most underrated supplement um, is going to be sleep. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of the, uh, I, I would suspect that a lot of the supplements that people take um, can help contribute to recovery and being able to, you know, a lot of people have trouble sleeping, um, but a common supplement would be zinc and magnesium, which can help the body relax. Um, and it can help people get into a deeper sleep. Um, and so there, uh, I think that sleep can solve a lot of issues. <laughs> um, we are in general chronically underslept. Um, there's a lot of research on the, uh, uh, the lack of sleep contributing to developing Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and so making sure that we're hitting those markers, it's not, um, it's not fancy, but those basics of sleeping, moving, extra, uh, eating well, those are all going to feed into each other. If we're eating a balanced diet, we're going to sleep more. We're going to be able to fit, uh, fuel physical activity. The more physical activity we're doing, the more our body is going to sleep, the better sleep we're going to get, which is then going to refresh us and wake us up. It fills up our willpower fuel tank so we can make the right decisions when we're eating. Um, it gives us enough energy to move. Um, and so it's, it's a healthy cycle, but breaking into that um, can be difficult. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that all the, the supplements are good. There are benefits to all of them. Um, but the first thing I would prescribe would be making sure that you're getting as much sleep as you need. That is, that is so that sensible, is so and I can't sensible. imagine, I can't imagine sensible, sensible, advice. sensible advice. As a person who suffers from autoimmunity, the thing that my medicine, number one medicine, is sleep. I need, yeah. if, if my body's saying, you need to shut down, there's fatigue going on, I just, I just shut the door, I close the door, you know, and I sleep, and I feel repaired, and I think that that is actually one of the best pieces of advice 
I've, we've heard of anybody that's been on the show. So that's amazing. That's amazing. And such simple things that people avoid and they take the expensive route with actually something as simple as that. Where do you sit on the issue of hydration? Because this is a little bit of a, a hot topic a hot topic for me i'm a, also come from a healthcare background and we don't we don't also prescribe um things you know we we can say what we're sharing our, our experiences or you know it's the, uh, anecdotal evidence for instance but uh, but yeah so on on the issue of hydration um where do you sit and how much do you would you recommend that people are drinking in the U, in the uk for healthcare professionals we're saying one and a half to two liters a day and then i'm hearing stories of people drinking four liters and huge huge amounts of water what do you think about hydration what does your research say around that it's a it's a great question um i think the interesting thing around hydration is uh, one overall, there's some research supporting that people don't necessarily drink enough water. Um, and uh, that now that we're sort of talking about sleep, um, it's also interesting as not a lot of people, right? When um, we have sort of like subjects in the lab or students here, they're like, oh, like, I'm really tired. I'm like, oh, what's the last time you drank water? Have you drank water today? Are you, are you hydrated enough? You have you um are you do you have a water bottle with you are you carrying it around um and they'll say like oh i only slept four hours last night i didn't drink any water since you know a day ago and i'm like oh that's kind of interesting maybe those things certain like markers or indications that you could you should probably do those things and you'd feel a little bit less fatigued or tired overall um generally speaking i also think that it we've highlighted athletes and uh, specific lifestyles. I think it's interesting too that uh, people tend to not drink enough water, largely depending on their lifestyle and the physical demands of each day. Um, I know, so Alec and I, uh, we tend to train a bit um, within our own lives, like mostly every day as much as we can, uh, do a lot of cardio and lifting. Um, I'm pretty sure that I don't drink enough water. Um, and when I, I, I try to I have my water bottle here, but um, at times, you know, we're probably drinking more coffee than water than anything else. Um, I also feel that the, the sleep bit was a personal attack to me because Alec knows that I don't sleep enough, but that's besides the point. I wanted to throw that out there. Um, I'll try my best, Alec. I'm doing, I'm doing better. I'm doing better overall. Um, I think that hydration, right, comes in many different forms, right? Water is uh, obviously one of the best things we're sort of been given. Um, outside of that, it largely depends on, um, you know, your own training. Some people, you know, will do electrolytes or try to get more sodium and potassium in their diets, right? Uh, I think the interesting question that I have for you guys is, are you drinking enough water? Um, are you hydrating enough in your day? Um, Probably not. Too much tea. Oh, okay. A lot of tea. A lot of tea. English tea. English Big tea. mugs of tea. About too many of them to count. But, uh, but need to drink more water. You just, I've seen the little water bottle over there and I'm like, I need to have some water. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Um, there's, there's definitely, uh, you know, if I, I think we're taught, we could talk about two different populations. So um, also a very active population. Um, I'm sure Luke, when you go on a um, hundred mile bike ride, um, you know, hydration is a much bigger factor. Um, you're going to notice if you're under hydrated a lot more fast than someone who's sitting down and working or just walking around. You know, we say that um, in, in general, the, the commonly accepted metric would be that around 2% of body weight loss through sweat, you're going to start seeing um, performance decre decrements. Um, you start going to, to be feeling tired. Um, the, uh, I don't know that there's a conclusive finding. Um, I think in general, like for going through our everyday lives, if you're thirsty, drink water. <laughs> like you don't need to, you, you probably don't need to uh, prophylactically hydrate um, unless you know where you're, you're not going to be able to, to get water for a long time. Um, but if you're going to be near, near a water source, your drinking water source, um, it's probably okay to drink when you're thirsty um, and not too much before then. And what is your take? You guys, you what is your take? You guys, you what's your take on take on hydrogen water? You know, with the, uh, the these new water bottles with the hydrogen in. <laughs> yeah. 
I, know I don't know. I don't have a take. I don't know if you yeah, know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I, I'm familiar with them, actually. No. Okay. No. I think, Luke, I think, Luke, when you're in real academia, actually proper hardcore science uh, and, and come from a scientific background working in a college or a university, probably the pop science isn't necessarily... <laughs> I mean, maybe I don't know if you're referring to like like alkaline water. I know that that's that's very popular. Um, there, there's I think conflicting theories about whether all trying to alter your body's pH is good or bad. Um, I, I, for the for most people, most times, just just regular water is probably fine. You don't need to spend um, you know five bucks on yeah. on a bottle of water unless you want to. Unless you know yeah. if that's yeah. what's going yeah. to make you yeah. drink it, it feels like a treat to yourself. Uh, Maybe there's something to be said for that, in all honesty. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, I just wanted to close our discussion, unless Luke's got any other questions. Luke, any burning question you wanted to, to um, I think, ask? No, well, I think it's amazing. I mean, the one thing I would be really interested in doing, reading, is if there's any papers or anything that's come you know, in with, with, with you guys, if you've done something or been working on something, particularly, as I say, the atrophy for me, because I'm like 60 next year, and I'm thinking I can't start losing any muscle. I've got to be a building muscle. So if there's any, you know, anything that you've got that's like, you know, research or papers and saying, you know, like we discussed about the protein and how much actual uh, lifting you need to do to actually create those things. So the science around that, I'd be really interested to read up on. Yeah, yeah, we we, we, we would love we to would share, love to share research, research with our audience. With our audience for that. Um, um, we will make we'll put some um, links to 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 any of your um, uh, websites and uh, mm. and uh, any of your papers that you would love to share with us. I'm sure that we would all uh, our audience would love to see those. So uh, we always finish our um, our podcast with um, just asking our guests if there were any. It's a lot of people from across the world listen to us and, um, you know, we want to get those conversations. But we know that there's a there's a massive gap between where people want to be and where they are right now. And um, we want to really encourage people to sort of think about ways in of getting started. I think we touched on that a little bit earlier. But if somebody's feeling right now really overwhelmed in their life, maybe uh, nutritionally they're not in a good place. It might be that they, you know, have health conditions. Maybe they're suffering from obesity, diabetes, or just, uh, you know, uh, other health conditions that might be impacting on their mobility. What words of encouragement or, um, you know, practical uh, tips would you give them to really get them out of that place of, of feeling like it's such a far away thing for them to even consider. But, you know, which words do you have to get them started? I think that's a, a great question. I mean, um, I could jump in first. Um, I think um, at times, I, I think you could relate this with sort of anything in life generally, right? When it comes to just physical activity, right? You're not feeling the best or you're not eating the best as you should for your goals or whatever they may be. Um, I think that validating the idea that it's okay, uh, that everyone tends to do that, right? Like I have times where I should be eating or trying to get more protein or get more sleep or drink more water. Um, maybe today I should do an extra 10 minutes of cardio just to sort of keep up that specific standard that I set for myself previously. Um, that not every day, no one's going to be performing their best and that it's a very realistic thing to feel like that, as most people tend to go with that. Because um, whatever we're going through in our lives, right, um, we kind of sort of have to adapt and anticipate and evolve, right, and have a realistic conversation with ourselves that like, um, okay, today is, is one of those days where I'm not like, not feeling like I want to work out or I, I don't want to eat that salad or those veggies, right? Like I really want that piece of cake. I mean, and I think things in moderation are also a good thing, right? Being having that realistic conversation with yourself that you can have a balanced lifestyle, right? You can go out and enjoy yourself. Um, as well as you can also uh, spend that time in the gym or on the, on the, the, the bicycle, right? Um, trying to get back to a sort of a better place and also set those realistic goals like Alex previously mentioned, right? Um, and not to sort of have these grandiose, like, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow or the next month. Maybe walking a bit more, getting an extra 5,000 steps is probably a bit more realistic and a more, 
more bite size of a marginal way, right? A bit more feasible. Um, so there's some, some little things that I, I sort of relate to my own life, right? And I try to teach my, my clients to sort of be a bit more realistic uh, with things and, and, and to sort of validate their own feelings, right? And sometimes their own just feelings of not feeling the best, you know? And I think that's just okay, right? So in the grand scheme of things, uh, everything, everyone's going through it necessarily. Thank you so much. What about you, Alec? Any words of wisdom that you wish to share share with our audience? Sure, to to add to what Adam said, um, something is better than nothing. So if we're talking about in the gym, you know, doing two sets of an exercise, that's enough to get a little bit stronger, grow a little bit of muscle. Um, Two sets is better than one set, is better than no sets. Um, Walking, um, moving around for 10 minutes a day is better than five minutes a day, is better than not at all. Um, You don't have to set standards or goals that are super high. Um, As long as you're, uh, if today is an off day, and you don't feel like doing anything, okay, tomorrow, do a little bit of something. Um, People who, if they're in chronic pain, um, do what you're able to do. Don't exacerbate that. You don't need to run. You don't need to swim. You don't need to lift weights. If you enjoy it, that's great. But do something that you're going to be able to stick with and that you enjoy. Uh, At the end of the day, that will keep you consistent. That will build those habits and you'll be able to make your life that much better in the long term. That's amazing. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on Sweet Liberation, Alec Minero and from New York. And uh, we hope that you won't be strangers and that we can uh, invite you back again uh, on Sweet Liberation. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank Great. You so thank much. you.